Good morning, church. Uh, Welcome to the live stream this morning. We're really glad that you can be here. We're just going to jump into some worship really quickly. Not quickly. I'm going to jump in before I start rambling. Yeah, Father, thank you for turning up this morning. Thank you that we can uh, come and listen to what you have to say. Just sit down at your feet and hear your voice. Thank you for turning up every time we do this. Even though we're not two or three gathered in the same place, we're two or three gathered on Zoom, on YouTube. You are there with us. So we just want to say, come on in. Come on in this morning. Come on in, Father. Come in.
story of David and Goliath. David was a shepherd boy who lived in Bethlehem. He looked after his father's sheep. David's father asked him to take food to his brothers who were with Saul's army fighting the Philistines. David obeyed his father. He got up early the next morning and left someone else in charge of the sheep. Then he loaded the supplies and started off. David left his things with the man in charge of the supplies and ran up to the battle line to ask his brothers if they were well. While David was talking with them, Goliath came out from the line of the Philistines and started boasting as usual. Goliath was the hero of the Philistine army from the town of Gath. He was nearly three metres tall. He wore a bronze helmet and had a bronze armour to protect his chest and legs. The chest of armour alone weighed 57 kilograms. A soldier always walked in front of Goliath to carry his shield. Goliath went out and shouted to the army of Israel, Why are you lining up for battle? Here and now I challenge Israel's whole army. Choose someone to fight me. David asked some soldiers standing nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and stop him from insulting our people? Who does that worthless Philistine think he is? He's making fun of the army of the living God. Saul, the king, sent for David, as soldiers had told him what he had said. Your majesty, this Philistine should turn us into cowards. I'll go and fight him myself. You don't have a chance against him, Saul replied. You're only a boy, and he's a soldier. He's been a soldier all his life. Your majesty, he shouldn't have made fun of the army of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the claws of the lions and bears, and he will keep me safe from the hands of the Philistines. All right, Saul answered. Go ahead and fight him, and I hope the Lord will help you. Saul had his own military clothes and armour put on David, and he gave Dave a bronze helmet to wear. David strapped on a sword and tried to walk around, but he was not used to wearing those sort of things. I can't move with all this stuff on. I'm just not used to it. He took off the armour and picked up his shepherd's stick. He went out 
to, sh to a stream and picked up five smooth rocks and he put them in his leather bag and then with his sling in his hand he went straight towards Goliath. Goliath came towards David, walking behind the soldier who was carrying his shield. When Goliath saw that David was just a healthy, look, good-looking boy, he made fun of him. Do you think? <laughs> I'm a dog, Goliath asked. Is that what you've come after me with, a stick? He cursed David in the name of the Philistine gods and shouted, Come on, when I'm finished with you, I'll feed you to the birds and wild animals. You've come out to fight me with a sword and a spear and a dagger, but I've come to fight you in the name of the Lord all-powerful. He is the God of Israel's army and you have insulted him too. Today the Lord will help me defeat you. I'll knock you down and cut off your head and I'll feed the bodies of the other Philistine soldiers to the birds and the wild animals. Then the whole world will know that Israel has a real God. Everybody here will see that the Lord doesn't need swords or spears to save his people. The Lord always wins his battles and he will help us defeat you. When Goliath started forward, David ran towards him. He put a rock in his sling and swung the sling around by its straps. When he let go of one strap, the rock flew out and hit Goliath on the forehead. It cracked his skull and he fell face down on the ground. David defeated Goliath with a sling and a rock. He killed him without even using a sword. When the Philistines saw what had happened to their hero, they started running away. Morning church, I hope you're well and I hope you're having a good week. So we're going to be um, hearing more this morning as we go forward about um, bouncing back and facing your giants and um, what that means. But um, I think for me um, facing my giants was very much dealing with a lot of stuff in life um, that I tried to deal with lots and lots of times before. But how do you get past that? stuff that you've dealt with lots and lots of times before so it's all about resilience and I've got a ball here to help me demonstrate so when we're resilient we think of um, what that means it means um, bouncing back or um, as, as we like to say in this house bounce back ability um, it's really important that when something knocks you down that you don't stay down, that you bounce back. So like this ball, you might have seen them, a lovely flat ball. Um, pressure comes along, it could be anything. It could be stress, it could be isolation, it could be issues with eating, it could be addictions, it could be financial issues. But each one of those stresses pushes you a little bit flatter. But what do you do? How do you deal with it? Do you stay flat? No. you face it and you bounce back and you back where you were which is really great to be back where you were but what you really want is not to bounce back and be where you were before what you'd really want is to bounce forward and to start growing from what you did so how can I bounce forward with this I can't I'm just going to bounce back but I could be like this. Now you might think, how is that little tomato going to bounce forward when it's under pressure? All that little tomato is going to end up is squashed. Well, it's like this. You see, when you put the tomato under pressure, just like you did with the flat ball, there's only one thing that's going to happen. It's going to get squashed. It's going to explode. But those pressures, such as stress, and isolation and addiction and eating issues and finance issues 
will have one effect. They will eventually squash it so much that that happens. But what is that happening? That is the insides coming out. That is lots and lots of tomato seeds coming out um, into your environment. That is all that stress being taken by God. It's not just taken by God though, because it's a seed. And we know that with a seed, it gets planted. And from a seed comes new life. So for each of those stresses, each bit of anxiety, each giant that you've faced, God has taken as a seed and planted and it will grow as new life and from that you'll get testimony but also the people around you will see that you grow and that you've got stronger and that there is more fruit coming from you and from that people will start to ask your story and that is when you know that you've beaten your giants so thank you thanks for your time and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye. Hello. We all have different giants in our lives and often more than one. One of my giants or strongholds or addictions was always food. I've struggled and battled food addiction almost my whole life and it has seriously affected my health, giving me diabetes, arthritis and even, even leading me to have a stomach bypass surgery. But the giant kept leading my mind astray. I found, I found I worked out how to cheat myself and still eat a lot. I lost nearly 10 stone with the surgery help but it hadn't healed the giants in my mind telling me food was my comforter and my crutch. I became a Christian 20 years ago which is a testimony for another time but I was what I call born badly for although I fell in love totally with Jesus I carried through some of my old traits and addictive behaviours not letting Jesus slay the giant of my battle of my mind. Years came and went and, and, and up until recently I was daily trying and failing on some sort of diet. I got help with friends but pulled away in embarrassment when I failed again, making it even worse as I'd failed them too. I was letting my faith down too and I distanced myself from fellowship and going to church as I hated the way I looked and felt what an embarrassment to God I was, never ever letting him in to help me in that area of my life. Although my faith stayed strong throughout all of this and God blessed me with ministries, I knew I couldn't conquer the giant without God and without fellowship. I said to my mate John that I saw myself as a church without walls and that's when he said to me well come and join us we're now a church without walls so I said okay then and within a week we were having fellowship online and decided to do the Daniel plan which is eating only fruit and vegetables for our daily food I felt God had led me to this place so I agreed to do it I'm 14 days into it now and with prayer meetings online and having someone at hand to help through the struggling times I feel I am a conqueror to this giant. With Jesus standing by me, the Holy Spirit working with me and God the Father loving me. I know I'm a work in progress but standing with God and fellow believers now after so many years has taught me to fully trust him and never quite I've never quite made that step before. If you are struggling with any life's battles, turn to God. He lets us make our own free will, free will choices but he's always there for us to turn to and guide us through life and his word and the sacrifice he made by giving us his son for the world. So by Jesus dying on the cross and res resurrecting three days later, taking all our wrongdoings on his shoulders and giving us new life through him, he alone, Jesus, made a bridge for us back to God the Father and an eternity in heaven. So that's my short testimony about just recent times and uh, I hope that reaches out to someone. Good morning church, good morning YouTubers.
Today I'd like to talk about slaying the giants of life and I'm going to refer to 1 Samuel 17 which is David and Goliath. So in 1 Samuel 17 begins, the Israelites have drawn into battle with the Philistines because of their close proximity to the promised land. The Philistines were the greatest enemies of Israel and it seems like every time Israel turned around the Philistines are trying to take it over the land that God had given them. And this, this is still going on today. Uh, in, instead of uh, it being Philistia, it is, it's called the Gaza Strip. And instead of the Philistines, it's now called the Palestinians. But in verse 1 and 2, the Philistines had set up camp near two towns. And the one being Soko and the other one is Azaka, in the southern mountainous region of the Promised Land. Actually, this land belonged to the tribe of Judah. Now these two small towns were just a couple of miles apart and in between of these two towns was a valley and it was the valley of Elah. It was in this valley that the Israelite army had set up camp. Now history tells us that in ancient times it's very commonplace that battles uh, like this take, take place and that the two opposing armies choose the bravest and the strongest warrior of their armies and the two men would go to the middle and they would fight to the death. And whichever side lost, they would become the servants to the winners. And this was obviously what was happening in 1 Samuel 17. The Philistines already knew who they were going to send into battle. Um, his name was Goliath. And there's three things to note from the text about Goliath. The first being was Goliath's awesome size. He's massive. Verse 4 reads, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath. His height was six cubits and a span. Now the word champion in the Hebrew language literally meant the man of two middles. In other words he was the man who would meet with the opposing warrior in the middle of the battlefield to fight to the death. Incidentally six cubits and a span tall is about nine foot six. The second thing is Goliath's amazing armour. And verse 5 and verse 7 talks about this. It goes, He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armour on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. The shield bearer went before him, holding his shield and actually putting Goliath into position. It was only natural that a man of Goliath's stature would require armoury and weaponry different from that of a typical uh, normal sized soldier. Verse 5 again tells us that Goliath's armour weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's about 175 pounds. That's the weight of an average person. Verse 7 tells us that Goliath carried a spear that was like a long, heavy weaver's beam, and this weighed 17 pounds. The spearhead alone weighed 15 pounds. So Goliath's spear was 32 pounds. So you had Goliath's awesome size, his amazing armour, weighing 205 pounds. That's really heavy. The third thing to note was actually Goliath's arrogance. Verse 8 and 10 says this, Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me here, and if he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. The Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel. This day, give me a man that we may fight together. So the Philistines already knew who they were going to send into this life and death contest. They had selected their champion, Goliath. But for the Israelites, the choice wasn't so easy. And verse 11 says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The Israelites saw the thing in the natural. They saw a big man with a big mouth. Good armour and a big sword. And they were afraid. They were terrified. 
They had forgotten that the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was on their side. You can almost hear the Israelite soldiers arguing amongst themselves. I ain't going out there. No, you go out there. I'm not going out there. He'd rip me limb from limb. See, that's just what it was. For 40 days and nights, Goliath made his appearance before the Israelite army, taunting, tormenting them to pick someone brave enough to come out and fight him. Spiritually, physically and emotionally, the Israelite army was already defeated. Day after day, they listened to Goliath mock their God and they can't or they won't do anything to stop him. Isn't that the story of our lives? When we're faced with something massive, we just stand in fear and we can't move forward. On another note, we already knew that David had been anointed king of, of, uh, of Israel by Samuel in front of all his brothers and his father. David's eldest three brothers were already at the battlefront and they were Eliab, Abinadab and Shamanah. Difficult to say. In the meantime, Jesse, David's father, is back home worrying himself sick about these three sons who are amongst the Israelite troops camped in the Valley of Elah. Were they in danger? Were they all right? Did they have enough food to eat? Not knowing the welfare of his sons was driving Jesse nuts. So Jesse decides to send David, the youngest son, to the battlefield to check on his older brothers and bring a report back to him as to how they were doing. Well, when David arrived at the battlefield, he saw a pathetic sight. Imagine, if you will, thousands of Israelite soldiers sitting on the ground with their heads held low. David saw a defeated army that hadn't even set foot on the battlefield yet. And when he looked at King Saul, David could see the dark circles under his eyes from where he had lost sleep for 40 straight nights worrying about this giant and who he could send. Verse 26 tells us, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Well, verse 28, when Eliab, which is the eldest son, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? What are you doing? He knew David was to become the king and he was jealous because history tells us that it's usually the firstborn that takes the blessing. But we know through the Bible history that God doesn't always choose the firstborn. He chooses the right one. Verse 29. Now, what have I done? David said. I can't even speak now. Verse 30, he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. In verse 31, David said, David was, was overheard and, re, and, and it was reported to Saul. And they sent for David. See, David, David saw another sight, a sight even more disgusting than the pathetic Israelite army. He saw Goliath strutting forth and back, arrogantly issuing his daily challenge to the Israelites and taunting them with insults and blaspheming the God of Israel. At this point, David steps forward and volunteers to fight Goliath. Now let me make one point here, which I think is quite critical. David didn't step forward to volunteer to fight Goliath because he trusted in his own ability with a slingshot. No, no, no. He trusted in the awesome ability of the Almighty God. King Saul was reluctant to send David and take him up on his offer. And verse 33 says, And Saul said to David, You are not able to against this Philistine and fight him, for you are a youth and he is a man of war. In other words, David, this giant has lots of experience. This is what he does for a living and you have no experience. But David tells Saul in verse 34 that he's got loads of experience fighting lions and bears that attacked his father's sheep. So this uncircumcised Philistine should be, shouldn't be too much trouble to take down. So Saul's still thinking in the natural and saying if I can't convince this young man to take no for an answer at least I can dress him in my armour for protection on the battlefield. But this was a terrible idea. Saul was a very tall man and some commentators would say he was about six foot six or six foot eight and David's probably about five foot to five foot two. 
In other words, Saul's enormous armour was so bulky that it actually put David at a disadvantage. And to take away the one physical attribute David had in his favour, and that was his speed. David took off the armour and he went to fight with just his rod and his slingshot. And when approaching Goliath, David saw Goliath in the battlefield. Verse 42 tells us that when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained for him, for he was only a youth of ruddy complexion and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and, I'll, and, and give me your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Goliath was insulted. He thought it was some kind of joke. But David lets Goliath know real quick that this was no joke. Some commentators would say Goliath suffered from a disease called giganticism and that affects the eyesight and, and arthritis of the body, which is, could be the reason why Goliath, Goliath said sticks, because David only had one rod. And he also noticed that David uh, could, and Goliath couldn't move very far and his shield man had to take him to the combat. So that, you know, there are all these little things. Verse 45 says, David said, come to me, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts of God and the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Verse 46 said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of, to the, of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the sea. May they know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save by sword or by spear, but the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And with his slingshot in his hand, David begins whirling it faster and faster. And with Goliath slowly moving forward, step by step, Goliath starts running towards Goliath. And with one mighty hurl, he releases the stone from the slingshot and it hits Goliath right between the headlights. And the stone sinks into his forehead and never even knowing what hit him, Goliath fell face first to the floor. David trusted in the God of Israel. Today, Christianity and the church is facing a Goliath in the name of abortion, gay rights, lethargy, wishy-washy teaching. It's taunting, it's tormenting the church daily and it's afraid to stand up for the biblical teaching, fearing it will upset the unbelievers, in fact some believers. It's sad but it's true. The minority seem to have a bigger voice than the majority. Also, the same God is telling us that we can slay the giants in our life. Some giants haven't even got a name or a face. And they are the giants of fear. The giant of depression. The giant of discouragement. The giant of guilt. The giant of resentment. The giant of jealousy. The giant of anger the giant of loneliness, the giant of doubt, the giant of addiction, and the giant of sexual sin. And just like Goliath, these giants taunt us and torment us day after day. They wear us down and steal our joy. But then there are times when a giant has, has both a name and a face. A giant that is a, the obnoxious person you work with every day, or the giant that is overly demanding boss or the giant of a negative person who's always throw cold water on your ideas and also is hypercritical and criticises everything you do and make you feel worthless. Or, per or perhaps your giant is that one individual whose aim in life seems to be to make your life as difficult as it can be. Regardless of whether your giant has a name or a face or it doesn't, you and I can choose to do one of two things when it comes to facing the giants in our lives. We can do what the Israelite army did and look at the natural and we can allow the giant to torment us and taunt us day after day and walk around with our heads held down and accept defeat and let the enemy get into our mind and tell us how worthless we are. Or we can do what David did. We can rise up by faith in God and run to meet our giant head on, confident that our battle belongs to the Lord. It won't be easy. In fact, it's going to be the toughest battle you will ever face. But God doesn't give the toughest battles to his toughest soldiers. He creates the toughest soldiers through the life's hardest battles. 
You see, God doesn't care how big your giant is. In fact, the bigger your giant, the better. What God cares about most is how big is your faith when you and I face the giants in life. By faith in the Almighty God, God is honoured and he's glorified. And he will give us victory, for the battle belongs to the Lord. It's interesting, isn't it, that Goliath taunted Israel for 40 days and the devil taunted Jesus for 40 days. But Jesus held firm and he rebuked the devil. See, Jesus is our marker. He's our guide and shows us the way to freedom. To walk the life that Jesus wants us to have is a life of victory. Not, not defeatism, it's victory. For those of us who are doing the Daniel plan, just remember how David took on Goliath, not in his own strength, but with the strength of the God of Israel. And we too can take on that giant with our, with our God day by day and step by step and moving forward. And if you're listening or you're watching this and you have a giant in your life, you too can be free. Because in the book of John in the New Testament, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See guys, Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. If you give your heart to him, repent of the things you've done wrong, and through Jesus you'll see freedom. Thanks for listening, guys. Bless you guys, and I'd like just to pray if I may. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I would like to thank you for today, for the trials and tribulations that come our way. For it's through these that you strengthen our faith, Father. We rely on you to claim our victory over the giants in our life, for we know our hope, as is Nigel spoke about last week, our hope is in you. Father, I thank you for the guides on the Daniel plan. I ask that you protect them and you give them strength to overcome the temptations that come their way. Open up your word, Lord, to reveal a pattern of life that leads to victory. We thank you, Father, for all our brothers and sisters in CWW. And Lord, as we find our way and, we pray, and I pray you protect them, Lord, keep them focused, Father, on reading the word and praying for unity and direction. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our government. Lord, be with them, direct them as they deal with this coronavirus. Help them, Lord, lead us out of recession. Father, I pray for Israel. I pray for the peace over Jerusalem. Lord, protect the borders from their enemies that surround them. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Thank you, guys. And, uh
may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May his face shine upon you and may he be gracious to you. Father, I thank you. I thank you for today, Father. I thank you for this church. I thank you for this community of people. And I just pray that as we go on into the rest of the weeks, your spirit go with us. Would your spirit guide us? Would your spirit speak to us? Would your spirit lead us? And would your spirit teach us? And when we go into places of unknown and we're fearful, spirit, would you stay with us? So, Father, I pray for these people that are watching. Father, be with them this week. into faith and may they know that you are above all Father you are in front of us and behind us, you are beside us you are all around us there is no place we can go where you will not be Father we love you I just pray blessings over these people Father, just keep them safe keep them protected and may they know how loved they are. In Jesus' name, amen.